She says, she's Katira Bourget. She's very new to Second Life. She joined two weeks ago, so it's all new to her. She is blind, and she uses an SL viewer called Radagast, which allows her to access this wonderful virtual world with a screen reader. It's a privilege to introduce you to our speaker today, Dr. Philip Yanos. His topic is, how do people diagnosed with mental illness become written off? How can they overcome it? Dr. Yanos is a professor of psychology at John Jay College, City University of New York. He is also the interim director of clinical training for the clinical psychology PhD. He's an internationally recognized expert on mental health stigma and its effects on identity, not only through his significant research, but as a published author, editor, and contributor to a multitude of publications. He is co-creator of a treatment approach called Narrative Enhancement and Cognitive Therapy designed to combat the effects of stealth stigma on people diagnosed with severe mental illnesses. In his new book and his talk today, he aims to make the importance of mental health stigma understandable and accessible to a general interest audience. Thank you for coming today. I'm sure that we will all enjoy this presentation. As a reminder, please refrain from talking or typing while Dr. Yanos is speaking. There will be an opportunity at the end to ask questions. And with that, Katira is very pleased to present to you Dr. Philip Yanos. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me to present at this conference. It's very interesting, and I'm very impressed by the types of uh, presentations you have today. Uh, really, uh, I think it's quite an exciting event. So the title of my talk is, How Do People Diagnosed with Mental Illness Become Written Off, and How Can They Overcome It? Um, I'm clicking the second slide here. Does everyone see it change? Okay, so that's... That's just uh, my name and my um, affiliation at John Jay College Criminal Justice, City University of New York. And uh, this is the cover of my book, which uh, shares a title with uh, this presentation. It's called Written Off, Mental Health Stigma and the Loss of Human Potential. So uh, if you're interested in the topic I'm talking about, the book goes a little bit deeper into these things, gives you a big... Uh, overview of this topic. Um, I'm really going to be doing a summary of a lot of different research that I and others have conducted today, so study. Um, in this next slide, I'm just showing a uh, quote uh, from uh, the recent news from uh, singer Mariah Carey, who recently became, uh, came pu became public uh, with uh, her diagnosis of bipolar disorder. And so she said that the reason why she didn't want to uh, reveal her diagnosis was that I didn't want to carry around the stigma of a lifelong disease that would define me and potentially end my career. And the reason why this really jumped out at me so much that I wanted to include it here is because she's somebody who has a lot of celebrity, has a lot of uh, resources, um, existing kind of credibility in the world as a result of uh, her fame. And yet she also felt that um, being associated with this label of bipolar disorder would somehow discredit her and make her not um, taken seriously by others. Uh, the next slide here just gives you an overview of the uh, things I'm going to touch on. So I'm going to review the extent of the endorsement of mental health stigma in society today. I'm going to discuss how stigma impacts the identity of people who've been diagnosed talk about how identity impacts the recovery process, and then talk about peer-led and professional ways of overcoming the effects of stigma on identity. So the next slide uh, is just touches on the topic of what is stigma, just to define it. Um, so uh, one of the more commonly accepted uh, definitions of stigma is something that occurs when elements of labeling, stereotyping, 
separation, status loss, and discrimination co-occur in a power situation. Uh, the important part of that definition is the power situation uh, aspect. So a stigma occurs when someone with more power um, uh, attaches negative stereotypes to someone with less power. Um, the, the essential part here that I want you to connect to is that you have a label, and in this case we're thinking of the label being mental illness. So the negative stereotypes that are most typically linked to uh, mental illness are expectations of violence, unpredictability, incompetence, and inability to work or function. Um, a little bit of background, when we're thinking about stigma, it can be helpful to try to put it into perspective what it was like um, less than 100 years ago. So um, something that was a very powerful, had a very powerful impact on the lives of a lot of people with mental illness uh, in the, the 19, you know, 20th century was the eugenics movement, um, which led to uh, a widespread forced sterilization laws in the United States and which also inspired a uh, euthanasia, what they called euthanasia program in Nazi Germany, uh, which led to the killing of tens of thousands, maybe even 100,000 uh, people with mental illness, uh, which preceded the larger Holocaust that uh, we all know about. Um, this next slide uh, that I've, sorry, let me, uh, so the next slide is just an image of a uh, piece of, um, piece of material from the American eugenics movement. Um, and you can see, uh, if you're able to see it, it says unfit human traits, such as feeble-mindedness, epilepsy, criminality, insanity, alcoholism, pauperism, and many others run in families and inherited in exactly the same way as color in guinea pigs. Um, so this was uh, intended to promote the um, uh, eugenics movement that uh, families with more positive traits, as it perceived, should uh, associate. But it also tried to promote the idea that uh, th those who had these unfit traits, which included mental illness, should be uh, sterilized. Um, the next slide is an image of a map of the 48 uh, contiguous uh, U.S. states. Uh, and as of 1935, it shows how many had uh, forced sterilization laws in place. Uh, so it just gives you a sense of the scope of it. Uh, the majority of states had enacted forced sterilization laws by that time. Uh, the next slide is just a picture from uh, Nazi uh, propaganda, uh, which is a picture of uh, people uh, with mental illness that says, uh, it translates as meaning life without promote the uh, T4 program, which was used uh, to uh, continue, you know, conduct this extermination that happened prior to the Holocaust. So uh, we have a pretty dark history here. Uh, what is it like now? Um, so uh, the next slide um, uh, says, uh, sorry, I'm moving ahead so I can see. Uh, it says, do negative stereotypes about mental illness still exist? So we know about this from surveys that have been conducted. And the first kind of big comprehensive survey of this was conducted in the US in the 1950s. And um, there was an interesting examination that compared the findings of that to findings in 1996. And there was actually evidence that um, negative stereotypes had increased to some extent, especially about um, people diagnosed with schizophrenia. Uh, there was also a comparison between 1996 and 2006 that found no decrease, uh, this in the United States, uh, it, both in beliefs about dangerousness and desire to maintain social distance. And we also have um, examinations uh, on a global scale that have not found improvement in attitudes toward people with schizophrenia on a global level. Uh, the next slide uh, shows some of the uh, attitudes that are uh, endorsed on a global level and how much they're endorsed. Uh, this is from a large uh, study of 16 countries. So uh, likely to be violent to others was endorsed by 53% on average around the world. Not likely to be productive was endorsed by 51% on average. Unpredictable was endorsed by 70% on average and shouldn't care for children was endorsed by 
So all of this indicates that stigma is not just a thing of the past. It still exists. It's still with us. Um, so the, the question then, if we're thinking about identity, is do the people who have a diagnosis there? Uh, if they don't, then it's not going to impact them. But um, every uh, bit of evidence that we have uh, indicates that people diagnosed with mental illness are very aware of uh, these negative stereotypes. So we have uh, large studies that have found that 70% of people with mental illness uh, diagnoses anticipate discrimination from others. And we also have a large number of studies that have found that 60 to 70% of people diagnosed uh, endorse that most people hold these views and would re reject a person with a mental illness as a friend, uh, co-worker, um, et cetera. So uh, this indicates that people are really quite aware. Um, the next question is, how do they become aware? And for this, we have um, a very uh, clear theory called the modified labeling theory that uh, Bruce Link uh, has um, uh, developed many years ago, and there's really a lot of evidence for it. But basically, what this theory says is that we all grow up in society um, learning about these stereotypes, and we uh, become aware of them through the socialization process. And then as we uh, grow up and start to develop uh, mental health problems ourselves or start to get an inkling that they might be coming, uh, you get this, oh, my God, this is me uh, kind of re reaction. Um, so uh, you don't have, ever really have to be treated um, badly or in a discriminatory way to kind of uh, link stereotypes to yourself because you learned about them when you were growing up. But it certainly can make it worse if you do have those negative experiences. Uh, this next slide um, it says modified labeling perspective. It's just a kind of a simplified graphic of that. Um, so you can see it says um, diagnosis of severe mental illness plus aware of negative stereotypes leads to stereotypes take on personal relevance or what I'm calling stigma concern. So. If people then become aware, uh, what happens? Um, well, if they start to have social rejection experiences, let's say they decide they're going to open up to people, and um, some people are supportive, but others are not supportive, and they get those aversive experiences. Um, we find that there are the significant minority of people with mental illness report having had discrimination experiences. So this can definitely impact people. And once you've had one of those discrimination experiences, it can really um, kind of discourage you strongly from then opening up to others. We also have evidence for uh, something uh, called microaggression from the research that I and some of my um, partners in my research have done. And so uh, we're probably all familiar with the concept of microaggressions with regard to race, ethnicity at this point. But we wanted to kind of see if this applies to people with mental health diagnoses as well as another kind of form, more subtle form of discrimination experience. Um, and so uh, we did a study where we found that uh, people with mental illness did endorse having these kinds of experiences. And so we kind of categorized the things that they experienced. And they fell into the categories of invalidation, uh, assumption of inferiority, what we call second-class citizen, fear of mental illness, and shaming of mental illness. So the next slide just gives you an example of an invalidation of uh, microaggression. Um, sorry, make sure I change that. Uh, a quote from somebody in our focus group. So the person said, people in my family, if I actually start being happy, they're like, are you sure you're okay? You look happy today. It's like I'm allowed to be happy sometimes, or if I do a lot of activities, or if I stay up late, I'll have people call me up and say, maybe you're manic, you stayed up really late, You've done a lot more things than usual. So the experience of this person was that uh, even normal happiness gets kind of pathologized uh, when you have had manic episodes uh, or you have that diagnosis, and people are kind of not allowing you to have that type of normal happiness or trust that. Uh, it could be that. Um, the next slide it just shows an example of kind of uh, microaggression from the wider media, which is uh, this is a candy bar wrapper. 
that I actually saw in San Francisco, in the San Francisco airport after I'd attended a anti-stigma conference, ironically. And so uh, it says um, Alcatraz, like a ward bar, nuts. Uh, and so this is the type of thing, a sort of subtle kind of discounting or, uh, you know, treating it like this is an okay thing to do to uh, make light of people's uh, experiences. Um, and this is something that I think is a lot more common than many people realize. A little more about um, microaggressions is we created a scale uh, that can assess it among community members. And so we piloted the scale uh, with general community members. And I can give you some uh, info on the endorsement of that. So um, it has three subscales. Uh, the first is assumption of inability. And so it has a, a, a sample item is if someone I'm close to told me they had a mental illness diagnosis, I would try to talk more slowly so they wouldn't get confused. Um, and we have patronization. If someone I'm close to told me they had a mental illness diagnosis, I would frequently remind them that they need to take their medication. And the fear of mental illness subscale has an item. If I saw a person who I thought had a mental illness in public, I would keep my distance. So these are some of the items that we uh, put in there based on what we'd heard from our focus group participants, people who had uh, experienced these types of things. And we found relatively high endorsement of them. It seemed that a lot of community members were be uh, willing to endorse doing these kinds of things. Um, okay, so the next slide uh, just touches on that uh, social rejection experiences seem to have an impact and to increase stigma awareness and concern. And sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I'm on the right thing. Um, and so then the next question is, how does this impact a person when they're aware of negative stereotypes in society based on what they've grown up with and what they've experienced. So um, Pat Corrigan, uh, who's a very important researcher in this area, and Amy Watson, they developed this model that basically there's three possible, we call them uh, indifference, righteous anger, and the last one I'm going to call self-stigma. They use a different term. Um, so my graphics here will just kind of try to explain what leads to each one in a simplified way. So uh, you can see from this graphic, it says indifference. And uh, we have low or high perceived stereotype legitimacy and low group identification leads to indifference. What does this mean? Basically that um, it could happen if you don't really think of yourself as a part of the group, you don't identify with this group of people with mental illness. Uh, if that's the case, then you could be indifferent. It could also be that you do identify, but you really uh, dismiss uh, these stereotypes and you don't really give them much credence. And as a result, your kind of your response is sort of like, it doesn't matter. I don't care about it. Um, the second possible re uh, response that they talk about is what they call righteous anger. And in this case, people do have identification with the group identify as being a person who's been diagnosed. Uh, maybe they identify as having the disorder as well, but they um, reject the stereotypes. They think that they're wrong. Uh, and as a result, they, um, they kind of feel that this is an injustice and they have to oppose it and maybe um, do what they can to change people's minds about it. In the last possible um, response, which I'm calling self-stigma, uh, people are they they aware of being in the group and they um, have identify identify with it. But they believe that these stereotypes are legitimate. Um, they think that it's true that people with mental illness are dangerous or incompetent. So um, in this case, we have a toxic combination of believing that you're a member of the group and believing that these negative stereotypes are true. So this is where we kind of get into this area of identity. Because if you believe that you're a member of a group and you believe that the stereotypes are true, it's going to start to affect how you define yourself. So um, what do we mean by identity? This next slide just kind of gives a simple definition. Identity refers to the social categories people use to describe themselves and that others use to describe them. Um, 
we have our own identity, but we're also influenced by the categories that others impose on us. So I may, def I may define myself as a father and a professional and a nice person. Other people may think of me as a boring teacher, as a blowhard. Uh, if I don't know about that, it's not going to affect me. Uh, but if I am, it's going to affect me, and I'm probably going to feel a little less good about myself if I know people think of me as a teacher. So um, in the next slide, it basically states that when we talk about this uh, idea of self-stigma, we're really talking about people developing a stigmatized identity. And what this means is that through a variety of processes, uh, the identity of having a mental illness uh, and that being something that's associated with negative things, takes over and supersedes other identity categories. So people who've been diagnosed with a mental illness have many identities. They're musicians, they're spiritual people, uh, veterans, uh, spouses, parents. But the mental illness identity, when it's become linked to these negative stereotypes, can come to overtake these other things and become primary. Uh, the next slide um, tries to touch to some extent on how this can happen. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, it's a gradual process. Um, there was an interesting study that was done back in the 80s uh, by uh, someone named, uh, I think, uh, Joseph Lally. Uh, and he, he kind of interviewed people about how did you come to believe you uh, that you're a mentally ill person? He found that there was a bunch of things that, that were kind of trend, sort of uh, important transitional events. Uh, for some people, it was hearing the diagnosis. Uh, for other people, it was applying for disability, which um, I don't know if this is a predominantly US audience, but in the United States, when you apply for disability, you basically have to proclaim that you're permanently unable to work. Uh, it's kind of this dance that people have to go through where they, they claim that even if they don't believe it's true. But what we found is that what, what, at least what Lally found is that a lot of times people start to believe it's true because they have to sort of claim it so strongly. Um, other things that can occur might be when professionals say, you know, you have to give up on your dreams. You're not going to be able to do the things that you wanted to do. And um, this hasn't really been studied, but it's been uh, reported in a lot of personal accounts that people have written. So I think it's something else that we have to take seriously. Um, the next slide is a quote from uh, the first personal account that talked about self-stigma. It was titled uh, Self-Stigmatization uh, by Kathleen Gallo. And so I'm just going to read it to you. Uh, she said, I perceive myself quite accurately, unfortunately, as having a serious mental illness and therefore as being relegated to what I call social garbage heap. I tortured myself with the persistent and repetitive thought that I would, that people I would encounter, even total strangers, not like me and wished that mentally ill people like me did not exist. Thus, I would do things such as standing away from others at bus stops and hiding and cringing in the far corners of subway cars. Thinking of myself as garbage, I would even leave the sidewalk in what I thought as exhibiting the proper social, proper deference to those above me in social class. The latter group, of course, included all other human beings. So really a very negative self-image, feeling that she's beneath others. Um, so now, those of us who are interested in this, uh, how do we know if it's happening? Uh, well, we use uh, scales. There's a number of scales that have been developed. Uh, there's one, the most commonly used one is called the Internalized Stigma of Mental Illness Inventory. There's also the Self Stigma of Mental Illness Inventory. And there's some other less, used, less frequently used uh, scales, such as the Self Stigma of Depression Scale and the Modified Engulfment Scale. Uh, just to give you a sense of what the internalized stigma of mental illness scale uh, touches on. The next slide shows some sample items. Uh, so mentally ill people tend to be violent. Very simple. If people endorse that, they're endorsing a stereotype. Uh, I am embarrassed, I'm embarrassed or ashamed that I have a mental illness is indicative of uh, what's called alienation. There's some positively worded items such as people with mental illness make important contributions to society. And so those are you know, in the opposite direction. Uh, they kind of the, the counterpoint to self stigma. Uh, another item would be uh, because I have a mental illness, I need others to make the most decisions for me. Another endorsement of the stereotype. 
So we use this scale. Um, I already told you that there are those three possible uh, theoretically uh, responses. So how many people um, endorse uh, having this stigmatized identity? So what the next slide shows is just kind of what we tend to find in research. Uh, what we tend to find is that about 20 to 40 percent of people with severe mental disorders uh, show what we might consider ele elevated or clinically significant self-stigma. Uh, and the biggest study that was done was done in Europe uh, with over a thousand people uh, across 14 European countries. And it found that um, people with schizophrenia uh, spectrum disorders uh, were more likely to have this elevated self-stigma. There were about 40 percent that were in that elevated range. But it was still common among people with bipolar disorder and depression where 22 percent had the elevated self-stigma. Uh, there's been a lot of other studies that are done, have been done. So really, um, there's really pretty strong evidence that it's a pretty common phenomenon. So the next slide uh, is particularly prone to it. Uh, interestingly, there's not a lot of evidence for variation between people, not really by, by um, gender or age. Um, we have evidence, uh, or, or ethnicity, we have evidence for it being more common among people with a schizophrenia spectrum diagnosis. We also have some interesting findings regard, with regard to country of origin. So I'm, I'm a Greek heritage, if, if you may have guessed by my name. So it was interesting to me, but not a big surprise based on what I know from my culture uh, that self-stigma was most highly endorsed uh, in Greece, uh, you know, in these European countries that they examined. Uh, it seems that there's an association between uh, the community attitudes and the extent to which people endorse these views uh, and take them in into their identity. But that's something that really needs to be studied for. So now we're getting into the crux of what I want to talk about, which is how does this affect people? Uh, so they um, they have uh, you know endorsed self stigma, but what does it do to them? How does it affect the trajectory of their uh, recovery? Let's say. So this is where I've kind of gotten most uh, into the research, and so with my colleagues uh, David Rowe and Paul Lysacker, we came up with a conceptual model. Uh, so just quickly. Uh, the next slide is a screenshot of the uh, article where we pro propose this illness identity model. And I'm just shifting to the next model, uh, next uh, slide, which is just a picture of the model, uh, a, a diagram. Uh, basically, um, what this diagram shows is that we predict that uh, when you have this combination of internalized stigma and an awareness that you have a mental illness, it has this direct effect on hope and self-esteem. And that um, this has an effect on uh, increasing risk of suicide. Uh, we know that hope and self-esteem impact uh, likelihood of suicidal thoughts, at least. Um, it also has a negative impact on coping and engagement in treatment. Uh, basically, people who don't have hope are more likely to feel like, what's the point? Why should I try to really uh, put my effort or put effort into treatment? This has uh, a further impact on vocational outcomes. People are less likely to go back to work or to best effort into working. There's also an effect on social interaction where people become more isolated, uh, withdraw more from others. And finally, there's this effect on symptom severity. So we don't think that this has a direct effect on symptoms, but we do know that when people are more socially isolated, it can make symptoms, even psychotic symptoms like delusions and hallucinations uh, worse. So this is what we proposed, and we did a few studies where we tried to kind of test it. So I'm just kind of going to zoom through uh, that a little bit because I don't want to get bogged down in the, the stats and things like that, but um, because I've just explained it. Um, the next slide is just a screenshot of our first paper on this that we did where we um, we proposed that there was this interaction between um, awareness right, or insight and internalized stigma that uh, impacted hope, social functioning, and self-esteem. Um, and so a summary of it is that um, we wanted to know when does it happen that insight has negative impact? 
Um, we, we believe that it does when it's combined with this um, uh, self-stigma. Uh, so we felt that in, insight can have negative impacts on people when it's combined with elevated self-stigma, but that if you uh, don't endorse self-stigma, in, insight can have very positive effects. So the next uh, slide is just a picture of the table from our study, which um, pretty simple. Uh, if, uh, if you understand what we're doing here, we just divided uh, a group of people with schizophrenia spectrum diagnoses into three groups. There was the low insight, low stigma group, high insight, low stigma group, and high insight, high stigma. If you want to think about it, we could think of the last group as sort of the self-stigma group. Uh, the second, the middle group, at which as being kind of the righteous anger group. And the first group is being kind of indifference. Uh, they basically didn't believe that they had mental disorders because they had low insight. So what you can just see from the numbers, the, the, the specifics of the numbers don't matter, but what matters is the uh, the differences between them. And basically what it shows is that the high insight, high sigma group had the lowest self-esteem, the lowest hope. Uh, they had social relationships that were just as uh, impaired as those in the low insight, low stigma group. And their symptoms were just as high as people in the low insight, low stigma group. The interesting thing was that there seemed to be some benefits to having low insight if you didn't endorse self-stigma in that uh, you had um, better self-esteem and better hope. The so group that had high insight and low self-esteem. The thing that we, that we took from this is that there's no, there's no benefit to having insight if it's going to be combined with self -esteem. So um, I'm going to move on now. I just uh, shifted to my new set of slides, so I hope that you see them. I'm going to click, um, hold on. Do you see the first of the slide that says take home message? I want to make sure that's working. Okay, you see it. Thank you. Okay, so basically it summarizes what I just said, is that the advantage of insight is lost when it's combined with self-study. Um, we did another study, uh, which is just a screenshot of the, of the uh, journal uh, page is uh, the next slide. Uh, and basically this was something that's called a path analysis, which is a statistical analysis looking at the association between variables. So I'm, I'm going to skip ahead to the diagram of it. Um, which is a, is a slide with a bunch of boxes. And so basically what it shows is that we had these significant uh, and pretty su substantial relationships between things that we thought would be related in large part. So uh, the, the little asterisk means that it was statistically significant. So there was this strong relationship between internalized stigma and uh, hope and self-esteem. Uh, less hope and self-esteem if you had more self-internalized stigma, that uh, this impacted coping, it impacted depressive symptoms, it impacted social avoidance, and there was this indirect effect where social avoidance uh, was related to more psychotic symptoms. So this suggested that we were onto something. Uh, what we weren't able to test in this study was the vocational part because we didn't have data on that. We did another study uh, which uh, the screenshot of the uh, journal article is the next slide uh, that I just put up. Uh, well, we looked at um, people who were in a vocational rehab program over time. And so we, um, we had data on what their level of uh, self-stigma endorsement was at the beginning. And we were able to see if it impacted how much they improved over time. So this was um, kind of giving us a, a better read on that. Um, so skipping ahead to the findings from this, um, essentially what we found was that people who had more uh, endorsement of self-stigma at the beginning, and this is even when controlling for their symptom severity, uh, improved less uh, five months later in the vocational So This suggested that this does have an impact on work to the extent that people who think that uh, being a mental illness is associated with inability to get better are less likely to actually 
get that or even when they're offered opportunities to work. And uh, just a quick uh, shot of the take home message from that slide. Uh, you might wonder if we're the only ones who have found this, but um, this has actually been studied by a lot of people around the world at this point. So the next slide is just a summary of some of the studies that have been done around the world and some of the different countries that have been involved. So you can see there are studies that have been done in uh, Israel, Germany, um, in uh, Nigeria, uh, in the developing world, uh, China, um, Spain, Switzerland. Uh, I've seen studies from Ethiopia, from Taiwan, Korea. So really, um, it's really being replicated in large part um, everywhere uh, and not just in the studies that we're doing. So um, it seems clear that there's definitely something going on here with self-stigma having an impact on people. So the next slide also just reports findings from something called a meta-analysis. This was done back in 2010. There's a lot of new, lot of new studies now, but uh, as of then, it uh, kind of combined findings from different studies and it looked at the pooled uh, relationships between uh, self-stigma and these other variables. And so it's found a strong relationship with hope, self-esteem, self-efficacy, which is has to do with sort of confidence and your ability to do things in your life, uh, but also things like quality of life, symptom severity, and then weaker but also uh, notable relationships with treatment adherence and social support. So again, uh, this indicates that um, Self-stigma does have a, a substantial impact, and there's something going on from this, is that um, evidence is accumulating uh, for the impact of self-stigma, and we need to do something about it. Okay? Uh, the studies are mostly cross-sectional, meaning most of the data has been collected at one point in time, but uh, there are some studies where the uh, data is collected over time, and we can see that this also plays out when you look at it over time. So now we're getting to the part about, well, what can we do about this? Um, so I, the first thing I wanted to touch on is, is it even possible to change identity? Um, back in the early 90s when I was getting into this area, um, I was strongly influenced by an article by uh, Larry Davidson and John Strauss. It was called uh, Sense of Self in the Recovery Process. And they weren't specifically talking about identity, but they were um, touching on a similar thing. And what basically what they found was that as people improved over time, their sense of self tended to change and evolve in a way where they had a greater sense of agency in their life. Um, and my friend David Rowe also did analysis of the same data set. Uh, this was actually his dissertation uh, back in 2001. And he found that as people improved, they evolved from having an identity of patient to person. Uh, in the uh, interview uh, narrative. This suggested that people do change over time as they get better, and identity kind of goes along with this uh, positive change process. Um, we also have evidence from quantitative studies that there can be improvement in self-stigma over time. So all of this suggests that there is hope. Um, how can we kind of step in and try to help it along to facilitate the change process? The first thing that has been around in the field uh, is peer support. And this is where people with lived experience of mental illness uh, step in to try to help others uh, who have, uh, who are maybe in the same position. Um, and all uh, has to go to the peer support movement for really starting this conversation. I wouldn't be talking about it if the peer movement hadn't initiated this discussion. So uh, back in the, uh, in the 80s and 90s, people were talking about how peer support uh, really put a big emphasis on changing identity and helping people uh, move from the identity of being a patient to an advocate, uh, being more empowered, maybe even seeing the positive impacts of, of having a diagnosis. Uh, the next slide is just a diagram from the, uh, from the something called the Icarus Project. Uh, which has this diagram of you are not alone. Uh, it, it's an example of the kind of thing that the peer movement uh, emphasized. Um, so we decided to, to study if there were changes in self-stigma over time 
with a participation in peer support. Uh, so the next slide is just a screenshot of our paper uh, called Participation in Peer Support Services and Outcomes Related to Recovery. Um, what we did is we uh, looked at people who were um, beginning participation in a peer-led uh, service setting, and we followed them over the course of six months. Um, so basically what we found is that uh, people who were, that we tried to study only people who were new, sort of just as they had just started. Uh, we found that um, people who regularly attended services showed significant decrease in self-stigma over time and an increase in self-esteem. Uh, and this was in comparison who, to those who did not regularly attend. So we can't say anything about those who never came at all. We didn't have any data on them, but we do know that the people who came kind of showed up and left. Uh, we tried to follow them, and they didn't really show the improvement in self-esteem and reduction in self-esteem of those who had stuck around it. This suggested that there is some impact of participation in, in peer support. Um, next, we wanted to see if there's something that we can do in the pro. Um, basically, uh, this is where I sort of uh, have tried to make my contribution by developing a treatment approach with my colleagues, David Rowe and Paul Lysacker, that we called Narrative Enhancement and Cognitive Therapy. And it wasn't that we didn't think that uh, peer support can do the job, but we just know that not everybody sticks around or even ever goes. So we wanted to be, offer something that could be available in the professional settings where uh, so much of, uh, so many people uh, get their services. So what is narrative enhancement cognitive therapy? Uh, the next slide gives a summary of what the elements of it are. It's a 20 session manualized group intervention and it has three main elements. Uh, there's psychoeducation, which is really uh, trying to help replace uh, stigmatizing views about mental illness with uh, empirical reported findings about rates of recovery and, and associations between mental illness and violence and things like that. I'm teaching cognitive restructuring skills to challenge negative beliefs about the self. And lastly, um, engaging people in storytelling exercises, which are geared toward improving their ability to integrate empowering themes into their life story. Um, so the next slide is just a picture of the manual cover for uh, narrative enhancing cognitive therapy for the English version. Um, the slide after that is the Swedish version. So it's been uh, been translated into a few different languages, but Swedish is one of them. Um, why do we pick this narrative part? Um, I don't have time to really go into that, but. There's a lot of evidence that narrative is a really important part of how we define ourselves or the stories that we tell about ourselves have a big impact on our identity. So that's why we wanted to bring that in. And uh, the next slide is just a screenshot of sort of a classic book on this topic called Actual Minds, Possible Worlds. And the next is a screenshot of something called the uh, it's a Frenia Oral History Project where people actually record um, and put in um, uh, mini narratives of their experience. So um, I don't, I think I'm running out of time. So what I'm going to do now is just give you a quick summary of the evidence for narrative enhancement cognitive therapy and just let people then uh, ask questions. It just uh, indicates the studies that have been done on narrative enhancement cognitive therapy. So there was a, uh, what's called a quasi-experimental study that was done in Israel, a small randomized controlled trial, that's what RCT stands for in the United States, uh, an uncontrolled follow-up study in, in uh, Sweden, and then a larger uh, randomized controlled trial that was done in Sweden as well. And then we have an ongoing study uh, that we haven't published our findings from yet that's happening in the US. So, um, I'm just going to move forward because I think I'm running out of time. Um, and let's see, I'm gonna move to uh, let's see. I'm gonna move to the summary. Uh, 
uh, where the slide should say conclusions regarding NEC. I'm going to move to that. So essentially what the findings of what these studies have found is that um, moving forward to the one that says conclusions regarding uh, that uh, we have evidence that it works uh, in re uh, reducing uh, self stigma and increasing self esteem and kind of the most compelling evidence comes from this Swedish study uh, which was a randomized control trial. Um, sorry, still moving forward. Okay. Uh, and okay, so you should see the slides as conclusions regarding there. And the type of effect that it has is uh, what they would call a medium to large effect uh, in, uh, in, you know, in, in this kind of in this field. What we don't really know yet um, is does it have an impact on things that are maybe even more important, like social function and relationships? We really only know now that it impacts uh, self image and self esteem. Um, we also don't know if it works when you're comparing it to a more active control group. So that's sort of what um, that would be a higher bar, and that's what our current study is trying to answer. So uh, it does seem like it is there is something to it, um, and it can help people. And I'm told that is now being uh, considered one of sort of part of the standard care that's offered in Sweden, position in the United States, but uh, we're a much bigger country. Um, the last thing I just want to give you is just a peek at some other interventions that exist. So um, narrative enhancement cognitive therapy is the one that I've developed, but there are others that have been developed kind of in parallel. Uh, so one that uh, is called ending self stigma. It's also a group based intervention, a little shorter. Uh, there's the anti stigma photo voice intervention, also group based, also in involves um, narratives, but in this case, they're linked to uh, taking pictures about your experience. Um, and then there's Honest, Open, and Proud, which was developed by my friend Pat Corrigan and really focuses on helping people to disclose uh, about having a mental illness to other people um, and really tries to focus on disclosure as the main way of diminishing the effects of self um, The next slide is just the uh, logo for Honest, Open, and Proud that Pat has developed. So I'm now going to the take home message, really the conclusion here, which uh, should kind of reiterate what we talked about in the beginning. So basically stigma impacts the lives of significant number of people with mental illness and it restricts opportunities for community participation, but it also impacts identity. Um, identity and identity change play key roles in the recovery process. So uh, it seems that you can't really have recovery without transformation of identity. But there's evidence that we can impact this through peer-led and professional means. So there is hope. There are ways to undo this stigmatized identity. So I know I've covered a lot of ground, um, but I hope that um, you've been able to follow me, and I welcome hearing your questions. Dr. Yanos, thank you. This has been amazing. Um, we have quite a few things <laughs> coming out here in the uh, in the chat. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Let me let me pull one out. Um, Luke has asked a question. Mm -hmm. She says, "Self stigma, on the average, would not take effect with one negative event." It is unlikely to be a singular imprinting. Such a change of self-image takes sustained repetition, repeated occasions to take hold. Can reduction or reversal of self-stigma through therapy be maintained if the person continues living in the same environment which encouraged self-stigma in the first place? Well, that's a great question, uh, which is that, um, you know, if if we're, we're trying to uh, help the person develop more positive views of themselves, but they keep getting this invalidation uh, in the world, 
uh, is it going to work? Um, I can only say that from the research, uh, there's evidence that uh, it does, but I would also certainly think that a person's environment, whether it's family environment or work environment, is going to be a complicating factor. Um, so I think that uh, it's important to understand that we're not trying to deny that uh, stigma exists. We're not trying to give people the belief that it's not real. Um, what we're trying to do is help them see themselves differently uh, to not internalize those messages um, and perhaps to develop strategies to respond to it when they encounter it. Uh, the most common response is concealment and basically kind of avoidance. So we have generalized social avoidance among a lot of people who have uh, adopted self-stigma. Um, we try to help people to develop uh, strategic disclosure approaches uh, with trusted people um, that can perhaps uh, discount uh, some of the expectations that they might have. Um, but, uh, you know, you can't control what other people are going to do. So I guess that's one of the reasons why some people are uh, scared off by uh, Pat Corgan's Honest, Open, and Proud, which really pushed this, puts this emphasis on disclosure. Um, what we often say is it's an empirical question. So, um, you know, let's... Tatiana, your introduction says, as a blind individual, she really appreciates that you were very descriptive of your slides. She respects that, and she said it's been a huge honor to meet you. Thank you so much. Are there other and questions? Yeah, Guana has a question for you. I just have to grab them. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Guana says, how do people like her with bipolar identity, ident with bipolar, identify with the stigma thing you were discussing? She wants to know how bipolar reacts with the stigma. Well, bipolar disorder is one of the more highly um, stigmatized disorders, perhaps less than schizophrenia. but. Um, it, it does, you know, self-stigma does occur among people with bipolar disorder. Uh, to some extent, it depends on what one's history is uh, with the mental health system. Uh, you know, there are two types of bipolar disorder. There's bipolar 1 and bipolar 2, right? And so bipolar 1 uh, tends to include, uh, there's often psychotic uh, experiences during the manic phase. Uh, this can lead to... Uh, involuntary hospitalization and things like that. Those kinds of experiences tend to be more uh, uh, associated with uh, the stigmatizing experiences. So uh, it does depend on the, um, I guess, the presentation and whether psychotic experiences are occurring, which don't occur for everybody with bipolar disorder. Okay, um, Donna says, he does suffer from spells of mania and depression. It's like flipping a light switch at times. Yes, um, it is a very uh, difficult with uh, people with bipolar disorder. I often want to try to see an integration of those two sides, right? There's both sides of the person, but um, it's the shifting between extremes is, is the big challenge. And Zombie says, she's noticed that fellow disabled people have a tendency to come together and are more accepting of friendships with each other. Do you think it's because we know the feeling of stigma or because we are disabled? We have a tendency to be more accepting and understanding of other people's disability, even if it's different. I think so. I think that that's, that was certainly borne out historically where um, the Americans with disabilities 
movement uh, and, and act, you know, and the movement that helped to lead to its creation required a uh, unified um, coalition of people with disabilities, including psychiatric and physical and, and other kinds of disabilities. So I think there is a fair amount of support in unity. Um, it's not always the case. Uh, sometimes within organizations, there can be kind of a hierarchy um, and sometimes mental illness tends to be uh, looked down upon even within the disability community. community. But uh, I'd say usually that's not the case and it's uh, there has been unity and that's led to very positive results, again, such as the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we have time for only one more of the many questions. I think we're going to have to have you come back, Dr. Yanos, and talk. Anytime. So I'm going to ask Marley's question. Marley says she is wondering about cultural differences. Some society norms lead to naturally self-deprecating behaviors, and some are just the opposite. We've got so many good questions. I'm sorry you can't answer them all. Right. So the issue of culture is an interesting one that's been understudied. Um, there is a little bit of discussion of it in my book, if you're interested, but not so much about self-stigma, more about the association between culture and stigma uh, on the community side. Um, and I guess uh, my colleague Larry Yang has studied this in the Chinese community. Uh, and um, the, the focus on face uh, and reputation seems to have a big impact uh, on the experience of uh, kind of feeling like you've sort of failed your family or failed to maintain the reputation that your family expects uh, in communities that place a lot of emphasis on reputation. Uh, there can be advantages certainly in terms of family support in those types of communities. Uh, but uh, it has its downside in this regard. I, I think it's not that different in the Greek community where we put so much emphasis on the family and uh, wanting to uh, kind of elevate the status of the family through your achievements. When you are not able to do everything that's expected of you um, or do it in the way that's expected of you, uh, there's a heavy uh, sense of uh, having failed that can really be uh, I think compound the self stigma But uh, I know I haven't directly answered your question, but it's an interesting area that needs to be studied further. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to change, <laughs> change out for the next presentation. We're just going to have to ask Dr. Yanos to return. Uh, we've got so many questions. He's got an awful lot to tell us. Thank you, Dr. Yanos. This has been really wonderful. Thanks so much. One of we will post the transcript on our website.